we start as we always start. Two pieces of advice. If you want to do well on an exam, it doesn't really matter which math course, it doesn't even really matter if it's a math course, you should do a couple of things. And the first thing is you should do problems. Because you're going to see things on the exam very similar to what you've seen before. Not a lot of surprises. You're going to look at these and say, ah, oh, this feels like something I've seen, maybe on a quiz, maybe on an old exam. If you do problems, you won't be surprised. And the other thing, of course, is take care of your health. Eat good food. Drink plenty of water. Take an occasional walk. Maybe not on Thursday because it's going to be raining, but, you know, prior to that, I encourage that. All right, so with that, we begin. Number one, given that x equals ae to the minus t plus b times te to the minus t plus ce to the 3t is the general form for solutions for x where you have x double prime plus x prime plus 3y prime plus a times y equals e to the minus 7t, bx prime plus x plus y prime plus cy equals 0, then determine the values of a, b, and c. So this is a fun problem, and I just want to make sure I put it into context of where this problem fits, so you understand why we're doing this. So here what you have is a system of two equations involving x and y, unknown functions. And we're trying to get down to something which just involves x. So this problem is one about, uh, I guess, let's say we wouldn't call it reduction of order, but it's, it's about turning a system of equations into a single variable. All right. And in particular, we want to get down to x. Okay. And uh, we want to figure something out. What we don't know, and what we're trying to solve for, is that there's these three numbers here, a, b, and c. Little a, little b, little c. And we're trying to find out what are just the right values for a, b, and c so that things will work out nicely. Okay, so, well, the way we do this is we use our denotation. So denotation, remember, is just a, a shorthand of saying that take a derivative. All right. So, we'd rewrite these equations as d squared x, because x double prime means two derivatives of x, so d squared x, plus dx, plus 3dy, plus ay, is equal to e to the minus 7t. And then the second equation, b times dx, plus x, plus dy, plus cy equals zero. Okay, so take your derivatives, rewrite it using our denotation. And so we have our, our system here. And now I'm gonna write this as a matrix. So we're gonna have xy multiplying by things. And so we say, okay, what's attached to the x? We have our d squared plus d. What's attached to the y? 3d plus a. Down in the next row, b times d plus 1, and d plus c. And that equals e to the minus 7t, 0. All right. So when you're, you're trying to reduce down to a single equation, an equation involving just x, or an equation just involving y, we rewrite it in this format. And now what we're going to do is we're going to use Kramer's rule. So this is a rule that lets us solve for one of our variables x or y. And we're going to solve for x, and we know because we have information about x. So that's why we know we're going to solve for x. So what we do is we're going to take the determinant of this weird matrix, and I say it's weird just because this d 
it's kind of a weird thing when you think about it. It means do something. It's an operator. So I'm just copying it down. Times x is equal to, and now Kramer's rule says, all right, if I'm trying to solve for x, I'm again, I'm again going to take this determinant, but now I'm going to modify it ever so slightly. So the key is that this portion is going to go into the x column. So the first column is the x column. And since I'm solving for x, I'm going to replace what the x column is by this function, or rather this right-hand side, e to the minus 7t0, 3d plus a, and d plus c. All right. Well, we just start doing our determinants. We should be very comfortable with two by two determinants because, well, we need to be comfortable with two by two matrices. We're gonna see a lot of those. So we have our d squared plus d times d plus c. Subtract b times d plus one times three times d plus a. All that times x. On the other side, well, the nice thing is we have a zero. That's good. So we just have this diagonal, d plus c, e to the minus 7t. Okay, well, let's clean up that right-hand side. So remember, d stands for derivative. So if I'm taking the derivative of e to the minus 7t, well, that would be minus 7 e to the minus 7t, and then there's a plus c e to the minus 7t. So we can write this as minus 7 plus c e to the minus 7t. All right. Well, hmm. Now we need to expand. So just be patient. When you FOIL, just remember, you know, first out or inner last, or just every, every one from the first with every one from the second in some way. So d squared times d makes our d cubed. d squared times c, well, that'd be a c times d squared. d times d is a d squared. d times c is a c times d. All right, then we have a b times d and a 3 times d. So that'd be 3b d squared. Don't forget the minus. It's easy to forget a minus, so be careful. A, B, D, and the minus. Uh, then we'll have 3D, again, the minus. And then we'll have minus A, all that times X. All right, so that's what we're down to. And at this point, we're hard like, ugh. Now, I will say, I like to throw in some fun problems for review sessions. So this is probably not exactly like the problem on the exam. In fact, I know it's not. But I like these problems. And at this point, you're probably thinking, OK, we kind of knew we had to do this. Because we knew we had a system of two equations. We knew we had to say something about x. We knew we had to get down to just an equation only involving x. But now it's sort of like, where do we go from here? And what haven't we used? Well, we haven't used anything about the fact that we know our general form for solutions. So now we come and say, OK, let's put on our hats from a few weeks ago, maybe almost a month ago. So here, if I'm just thinking of this as a solution to a differential equation, what would have been the roots? Because this looks like a solution to a constant coefficient differential equation. What would have been the roots? Okay, you'd have a root of negative one. How about from here? Negative one and, and three. Which tells us that, oh, if, if we now use, we can use our D notation, by the way. We haven't really talked about that, but our D notation could have been used before the previous test. So that says that the differential equation that this satisfies is d plus 1 times d plus 1 times d minus 3. 
So d minus the first root, d minus the second root, d minus the third root times x equals 0. Now, why do I have a 0 here? Because this is going to be important in our conversation. Well, notice th these are all just constant times functions. There's no extra superfluous piece. There's no part that doesn't have a constant attached to it. So in particular, you could assume that all the constants were 0. And then a solution would have to be x equals 0. OK. So, well, if we multiply this out, this is d squared plus 2d plus 1 times d minus 3 times x. And now I, I really wish I, I had bigger paper. All right, so that's d cubed. And then we have a 2d squared minus 3d squared. So that's a minus d squared. A uh, minus 60 plus d makes a minus 5d. And a minus 3 times x equals 0. OK. Now comes our great aha, which is to say, oh, let's compare this to that. Because we know x should solve this differential equation, given that we know what its general form is. And we know that x should solve this differential equation, because that's what happened when we reduced down. So in other words, these two equations need to line up. All right, so let's talk about matching. Matching, matching. OK. Well, d cubed matches d cubed. Great. Wonderful. What's our coefficient for d squared on top? Negative 1. What's our coefficient for d squared? Well, there's a couple things. There's a c, a 1, and a minus 3b. And there we go. Now we have our relationship there. OK, our coefficient for d upstairs, negative 5. That has to match our coefficient for d. So we start scanning. There where we see a c and a, a minus ab and a minus 3. OK. Now, the constant, minus 3, has to match this constant, which is minus a. All right. Now there's one more piece of information. The right-hand side. What needs to happen for these to match up? We need to have this coefficient, negative 7 plus c, equals 0. All right, so let's start solving. Is there anything we can solve for? OK, someone said a. That's pretty easy. Someone said c. That's pretty easy. All right, two down. We only have one to go. And now we just pick either one of the two remaining. Uh, wait, do we pick other? Yeah, this one can work. OK, if we put this in, we'll get negative 1 is equal to 7 plus 1 minus 3b. If we move things around, I can add 1, I can add 3b. That says that 3b equals 9, which says b equals 3. And so we found a, b, and c, so we have our answers. a equals 3, b equals 3, c equals 7. Now you might say, you didn't use this one. Well, it turned out we didn't need to. Sometimes you have enough information that you don't have to use at all, but you can check. OK, so suppose you wanted to check. Uh, here's our check. Negative 5, does that equal, question, 7 minus 3 times 3 minus 3. Does that work? 
Does negative 5 equal 7 minus 9 minus 3? Yes, it does. So it works, and we're done. We're done. Okay, all right. So again, I don't want you to get nervous, because I like to make funner problems. Expect straightforward problems. And the key that uh, we wanted to highlight in this problem, know how to go from a system of two equations down to one equation. There is a question, where did this come from, this negative 7 plus c e to the negative 7 t? Well, it came from doing our determinant on the right-hand side. So you have your d plus 7 times e to the minus 7 t. So the d times e to the minus 7 t says, oh, take a derivative of e to the minus 7 t. When you take a derivative, the minus 7 comes down. So that's where that comes from. And then c times e to the minus 7 t is c e to the minus 7 t. So it's one of these things where it can get confusing because you have so many symbols. It's like, wait, what does this symbol mean? Is it a number? Is it a function? Is it take a derivative? And so sometimes, you know, just like <gasps> take a step back and be like, make sure you know what everything represents. Any other questions? Yeah, how did you know how to, or when to use the D notation? Well, the D notation, and so D notation just, as a reminder, it just says take derivative. That's, that's really what it is. And the main time that you use the D notation is when you see a system of equations like this, where you have two equations, basically, but you could do more than two. When you have two equations involving two functions, x and y, and you want to get down to one, that's when you're going to say, let me reach into my pocket and pull out the D notation, because that's, that's your go-to. So essentially, it's a way to sort of uh, skirt around substitution, because substitution can be very tricky. All right. Let's move on. Number two. Two well-mixing tanks of brine. Ah, wonderful. Have the following properties. So, well, we have two tanks. We should draw a picture. All right. So here's our tank one. Call it T sub one. Here's our tank two. We'll call it T sub two. So initially, we have, so we'll have some initial. Tank one has 50 gallons of brine and 20 ounces of salt. Okay. Tank two has 80 gallons of brine, 60 ounces of salt. All right, that's the first bullet point. That just tells us what's happening at the start. Okay, so we have our our first bullet point. Okay, on to our second bullet point. Brine comes into tank one at five gallons per minute. So five gallons per minute with the concentration of four ounces per gallon. Four ounces per gallon. Pure water comes into tank two at eight gallons per minute. So eight gallons per minute and it's pure, so there's no salt. Okay, pure water. And I apologize, my handwriting is not very good. But inflow is five gallons per minute, four ounces per gallon. Inflow, eight gallons per minute, zero ounces per gallon. All right, so now we know how things are coming in. The next bullet point, how are things going out? So we have that brine is drained from tank one at eight gallons per minute, and it's drained from tank two at four gallons per minute. Now we don't know how much is going out at any given time because the whole point of the problem is that your saltiness can change. You can become more salty. And the last bullet point, Brine is pumped from tank one to tank two. So from tank one to tank two at a rate of six gallons per minute. And from tank two to tank one at a rate of 11 gallons per minute. Now, unfortunately, I don't have a lot of space, so that's why the picture is as it is, but that's all right. 
So if x is the amount of salt in tank 1 and y is the amount of salt in tank 2, set up the system of differential equations corresponding to the setup. Include initial values. All right, so it's all about setting things up. Okay, so suppose we'll start with x prime. x prime, I see derivative. Derivative means change. How is x changing? And we say, well, a couple of things. There's the inflow and the outflow. Hmm. Now the good news is there's a one clear inflow here, which is the five gallons per minute coming in with four ounces per gallon. And it says you're always getting 20 ounces of salt coming into tank one. Because it's just constantly coming in. Okay, so that's part of it. So we'll write 20. What else could happen? Where, do, where else can we get things coming in? Well, we look for the arrows pointing in. So there's the arrow from the brine, and then there's this arrow from the other tank. And now we pause and say, oh, we've got to be a little bit careful here. Let's go back. There's one thing I forgot to talk about, but now we can. Let's look at tank one for a second. How much is coming in to tank one? Well, five gallons and 11 gallons means grand total of 16 gallons per minute. How much is going out? Eight plus six means 14. 16 is coming in, 14 is going out. What's happening to our tank? It's going up. On a per minute basis, what's the net gain? Two, right? Because 16 minus 14. So we could say that the amount of brine at any given time is 50 plus 2 times t. So that's how much is inside that tank. That'll come into play as we set up the equation. In tank 2, how much is coming in? We have 6 plus 8, 14. How much is going out? 15. What's happening to tank 2? It's going down. With every passing minute, what, how much do we lose? One gallon. So the amount of brine is 80, is initial amount, then subtract T. One gallon for every minute. All right, so back to our, our setup here. So we already talked about the inflow from the brine bean coming in, but there's also stuff from tank two. So to figure out how much is coming from tank two, well, we need to know a couple of things. Well, we need to know uh, how much of tank two is coming over. We're having 11 gallons per minute. So that's our rate. Then you multiply it by a concentration. So the concentration is, well, the amount of brine in tank two, sorry, the amount of salt in tank two, which is y, divide by how many gallons there are in the tank. So rate times concentration. How much leaves the first tank? Yeah, we're losing a net of 14 gallons. And then what's the concentration? Well, x divide by 50 plus 2t. Have we accounted for everything coming in and coming out for tank one? Yes. We're going to add one more thing, comma. What's the initial amount in tank one? Well, it's 50 gallons, but x is the amount of salt. So it's 20 ounces. So that's our initial condition. And then we do the same thing for the other tank, which is the y. OK, how much salt is coming in from our pure water? Zero, because it's pure water. All right, well, we also have salt coming from tank two, sorry, from tank one. So we know the rate of flow is six gallons per minute. And then we have the same concentration of x over 50 plus 2t.
How much leaves? 15 gallons. And then we have our same concentration, Y over 80 minus T. What's our initial amount of salt? 60 ounces of salt. And here, we're done. It's setting things up. A surprising amount of the problems in differential equations that involve things like brine and mixing are about setting things up. All right. Well, because we're going off the initial conditions, right? So X is the tank one. It initially has 20 ounces of salt. Y is tank two, and it has 60 ounces of salt. And so that's the difference. All right. Let's move on. Number three, and I can see the last problem bled through a little bit. A model for the location of two interacting particles satisfies the following system. We have x double prime plus 2x prime plus 6x equals 2y prime. y double prime plus y prime plus 3y equals x prime. Rewrite this system in the form of x prime equals ax, where a is a 4 by 4 matrix, where x1 is x, x2 is x prime, x3 is y, x4 is y prime. So this is in contrast to the first problem. The first problem we had two equations and we said we want to get down to one equation but we're willing to take a higher derivative. This one is saying, oh, I want to get down, I don't want to go down in the number of equations, I'm willing to go up in the number of equations but I want to have lower order derivatives. So what we have to figure out is how all of these variables relate to each other. So we just, I'm going to rewrite for reference, x1 equals x, x2 equals x prime, x3 equals y, x4 equals y prime. Now the x prime, well that says what? It just says we're looking at the derivatives, x1, x2 prime, x3 prime, x4 prime. All right, so let's see if we can't figure this out. x1 prime, I know x1 is equal to x, so I know that's equal to x prime x2 prime, well I know x2 is x prime, so this is x double prime, x3 prime is y prime, x4 prime is y double prime. So we're, we're going to sort of just go through it, do them all simultaneously. Now the goal at this stage is we want to rewrite these derivatives in terms of x1, x2, x3, x4. So we need to somehow rewrite these, and so we start thinking, okay, is there a convenient way to rewrite x prime in terms of x1, x2, x3, and x4? It's x2. Because it, it says it right there, x2 is x prime. So that's really convenient. Then we come to this x double prime. We say, ah, well, that's, that's not so convenient over here. But we have this equation. We could rewrite this equation as saying, well, x double prime, that's equal to, uh, well, we'll write as 2y prime minus 2x prime minus 6x. And now we can just go through and say, okay, well, what is y prime? It's x4. So 2x4. And then uh, what is x prime? It's x2, so minus 2x2. What is x? Whoops, not x. Ah, why am I writing this as exponents? 2x4 minus 2x2 minus 6x1. Okay, coming down to the next line. Y prime, what is that? It's x4. Because it says it's right there. Y double prime. Well, Y double prime, again, we can use these e equations. In fact, you have to use them somehow. So 
we'll solve for y double prime. We say, okay, well, it's x prime. So that would be x2 minus y prime. That would be x4 minus 3y minus 3x3. All right, well, now we'll just write this in a little bit more convenient notation. So, well, I don't know if you'll agree with me that's convenient. So I'm going to write this as x2. I'm going to put these in order. Minus 6x1 minus 2x2 plus 2x4, x4, and then x2 minus 3x3 minus x4. So I, I'm just taking the same equations, but I'm writing the, the variables in order, and I'm lining them up. Now, of course, there's always the problem that you see, but then there's the parts that you don't see. So for example, there's a 0x1, and here there's a 0x3 and a 0x4, and there's a 0x3. Now, in practice, we never write this down, but just to emphasize what's happening is we say, look, there's everything is a linear combination of the x1 through x4. This most of the terms are zero. And what happens is when you really are writing the matrix, this a, it's your coefficients. So you say, oh, OK, so this is going to be, and uh, we have our variables x1, x2, x3, x4. Then you just read off the coefficient. So it's 0, 1, 0, 0, minus 6, minus 2, 0, 2, 0, 0, 0, 1, and 0, 1, minus 3, minus 1. And this part is our A. So when you're going from having a differential equation with lots of derivatives, and you want to say, well, I just want to get down to a system or build up to a system, you introduce extra variables to sort of step up the ladder, if you will. And it's just mostly a matter of figuring out how do you rewrite everything as linear combinations. All right. Good. Once you know how to do these, they're not too bad. Any questions? All right. Well, moving on. Number four. Give the general form for solutions to the following system of differential equations. All right. So we have x prime equals 4x minus 3y, and y equals a third x prime minus 2 thirds y prime. All right. So we have to solve for both x and y. Well, that should be fun. OK, cool. Um, there's lots of ways to solve this. And my, my hesitation here is not to be like, ah, how do I solve it? But rather, which one of the many fun ways to begin solving this? All right. This, looking at this, what would you think to try? OK. So someone has suggested substitution. We'll do that. You can also use your denotation. We can do that. Uh, and we can also do this using matrices. All right, so let's try substitution. So substitution says what? Well, essentially substitution and, and the denotation all have the same underlying idea. We're just trying to get it down to one variable. Just at something in x or just something in y. So looking at these, I would come and I would look here and say, this looks really tempting for y. And the reason I, I like this one is I can get y just in terms of x. 
And notice not y prime, y itself. And when you're making a substitution, you'd really, really like to get just the variable, not the derivative, just the variable. So for instance, you might say, but wait, why not here? Well, see, this would be x prime I can get in terms of y and y prime, but then I have to deal with that extra prime later on. <laughs> That's work. I don't want work. So, okay, so in this case, we can make a substitution by saying, well, 3y is 4x minus x prime, or if you like, y equals 4 thirds x minus 1 third x prime. So we get now substituting in. So everywhere where you see a, a y, you put in what it is in terms of x. So we're going to get 4 thirds x minus 1 third x prime is equal to 1 third x prime minus 2 thirds. And now, for y prime, you say, okay, take the derivative. So if y is 4 thirds x minus 1 third x prime, y prime is 4 thirds x prime minus 1 third x double prime. Okay, so that's our substitution. So we replaced y and y prime. Okay, and now everything's in terms of x. That's great. Uh, lots of fractions, but well, we'll handle that soon. Okay, so 4 thirds x minus 1 third x prime is equal to 1 third x prime minus 8 ninths x prime plus 2 ninths x double prime. And I am somebody who I like to get rid of fractions as soon as I can. It's just I've lost so many points over the years to fractions that I just, I'm, I'm determined not to lose more points. So I'm going to multiply everything by 9, clear out the denominators. So everything where there's a, a 9 on the bottom, okay, that's easy. When there's a 3, then it'll become, you know, 9 over 3 is 3. So we get 12x minus 3x prime is equal to 3x prime minus 8x prime plus 2x double prime. All right, well, move everything to one side. We'll get 2x double prime. We have a minus 3x prime, which will come over as a plus 3x prime. There's already one there, so that gets us up to 6x prime. Subtract 8x prime, that's minus 2x prime. And then we'll have that 12x will come over as a minus 12x equals 0. So we get x double prime minus x prime minus 6x equals 0. Ah, it's like they wanted you to have a nice problem at the end. Well, because we do. Okay, so we put on our, our hats, constant coefficient, linear homogeneous. We, we say this turns into an algebra problem. r squared minus r minus 6 equals 0. Does it factor? Yes. Yes. On a side note, you should expect things to work out nicely. No, like, square roots of 17 on the exams. You know, that's not our style. You should expect things to work out. How does it factor? R minus 3 and R plus 2. Okay, so we're, we're almost there. And of course, we can double check, right? That's R squared. You get a 2R minus 3R, which is minus R, and a minus 6. So that says that X looks like some constant A e to the 3t, and some constant c, e to the minus 2t, because our roots are 3 and negative 2. Are we done? No. no. What haven't we done? We haven't done y. Now, the thing is, we don't have to start from scratch. We can use our relationship from our substitution. We can say, okay, well, for y, remember that we said that's 4 thirds x minus 1 third x prime. 
So that's 4 thirds times AE to the 3T plus CE to the minus 2T minus 1 third. And then we take derivatives. So rid of E to the 3T, the 3 comes down, 3AE to the 3T. And then here, the minus 2 comes down, so minus 2CE to the minus 2T. And, uh, well, okay, so we have a 4 thirds A, E to the 3T, minus 3 thirds A, E to the 3T. If we put those together, we end up with a 1 third A, E to the 3T. Okay, because 4 thirds minus 3 thirds. Here we'll have 4 thirds C plus 2 thirds C. So 4 thirds plus 2 thirds makes 6 thirds, also known as 2. So there's our X, and there's our Y. And now we found the solution. Because when it says general form, it didn't specify X or Y, so the implication is we have to find both. Now some people might say, ha ha, Steve, why don't you just absorb that one-third into that constant A? Because don't constants absorb constants? You say that a lot, Steve. I do say that a lot. Uh, you have to be careful, though, because this A also shows up here. So I can't change this constant arbitrarily, which is what it means to absorb, unless I change this one simultaneously in the same way. So when you have multiple constants showing up you have to make sure that you keep them in sync. So you can't do one to one without doing it to the other. So that's why don't absorb the one third there. All right, so that would be substitution. If you did the denotation, you'd run into very similar things where you have to solve something much like this. So let's do this using matrices. And uh, we can do it, uh, oh God, okay, here. Let's, let's just do it here. All right. We have an x prime equation, yes? x prime equals 4x minus 3y. That's good. So usually when we think of matrices, we'd like to come up with a system of equations where we have x prime equals 4x minus 3y, y prime equals something x plus something y. And the question, of course, as always, what's in the box? What's in that box? Okay, so the x prime is good to go. Now, for the problem here is that we have an x prime and a y prime. Well, what do we get rid of? The x prime. We've already got our x prime equation. How do we get rid of x prime? Well, we have this equation for x prime right above it. So we could say that y is equal to 1 third 4x minus 3y. So in other words, this is our x prime. and then minus two-thirds y prime. Well, let's just uh, multiply everything by three to get rid of our fractions. So three y is equal to four x minus three y minus two y prime. And now, well, we move things around. We get that two y prime is equal to four x minus six y or y prime equals 2x minus 3y. So that's what goes in the boxes. 2x and a minus 3. Sorry, that's, I gotta make sure my negative shows up there. All right, now that you have it in that form, and sometimes they just even start with it in this form, what do we do? Well, uh, we write it as x prime equals our matrix 4 minus 3, 2 minus 3, x. And now, what are we after? Well, so, so here, when we're doing matrices, we look for eigenvalues. eigenvalues. Yes, eigenvalues. 
And then, of course, eigenvectors. We want to get good at that. We want to make that automatic. Because the more automatic we make things, you know, the less that we have to think during the exam, the better. You only have a finite amount of brain energy walking into an exam. And you want to make sure that you don't use it up on small steps. You want to save it for the big ideas. And so make things automatic. All right, so we take our determinant. And so we take our matrix minus lambda i. And so that would be 4 minus lambda times minus 3 minus lambda, multiplying on the diagonal. Subtract 2 times negative 3. We'll get lambda squared. And then we're going to get minus 4 lambda plus 3 lambda. So that's minus lambda. And then we're going to get minus 12 and a plus 6, which is a minus 6 equals 0. So we get lambda squared minus lambda minus 6 equals 0. Does that sound familiar? It's this equation, just with lambdas instead of r's. Coincidence? No. no, it can't be a coincidence. It's meant to be. The heavens have spoken. So our eigenvalues are still 3 and negative 2, which are the roots over there. Now you have to find eigenvectors. So you say, okay, for lambda equals 3, well, I put in lambda equals 3 into here, 1 minus 3, 2 minus 6, and I'm looking for something such that when I multiply 1 minus 3, 2 minus 6 by this vector, I get 0, 0. And uh, the easy way I like to do it is I just take this row, write it in reverse order, and I flip a sign. So I see a negative already, so I'm just going to flip that sign and put it as 3, 1. For lambda equals minus 2, we'll have 4 minus minus 2 is 6, minus 3, then we'll have 2, minus 3 minus minus 2 is a minus 1. And again, we're looking for some vector. So as we multiply here, we get 0, 0. And we can pick any row. I'll, the second row looks nicer here. Again, I'll just reverse and change the sign. So 1, 2. So now, what do we get? Well, our vector form looks like some constant a <coughs> times e to the 3t. So the 3 being the eigenvalue, vector 3, 1, plus some constant b, e to the minus 2t, that's our <coughs> eigenvalue, excuse me, uh, times 1, 2. And now the last part is just to say, oh, I can just separate these. And so if you read off the top row, the top entry, you get x equals 3a e to the 3t, b e to the minus 2t, and you get the bottom entry, y will be a e to the 3t plus 2b e to the minus 2t. And we're done. And if you look, they're the same. Now, you might say, wait, this says a and a third a, and this says 3a versus a. But again, that's just changing your factor of a by, by 3, scaling it by 3. So multiple ways to do that. On a test, we will accept just one way. You won't have to do it twice, just so you know. All right, any questions? If I had more space, I'd do another, another approach. But in the interest of time, we'll go on. OK, so our, our next problem, number five. Verify that the vector 2t, 3t, and the vector 2t squared minus t squared both satisfy 8tx prime is equal to 14 minus 4 minus 310x. OK, well, let's just do that. So whenever you hear our C, this word verify, it really is just code for plug it in. So verifying problems are just plug it in and just make sure everything works. 
a surprising amount of differential equations boils down to plug stuff in. Figure out what needs to be true or figure out is it true? And so, all right, so when we plug it in, all right, we'll start with the, the 2t, 3t. So here's our check. So we're going to have 8t times, take derivatives, and when you take derivatives of vectors, you do it entry by entry. So 2, 3, does that equal question? And on the other side, we'll have 14 minus 4 minus 3, 10 times 2t, 3t. Well, on this left-hand side, we're going to get 16t and 24t when we multiply it through. Over here, well, we do 28t, subtract 12t. So, you know, do the matrix multiplication. 28, subtract 12, 16t. Minus 6t plus 30t. That's 24t. And now we're like, aha, yes. Well, okay, I don't know what the symbol is for they match, but the key is you want to show clearly that you, you plugged into both sides. All right, so that's half of part A. The other half of part A is just to repeat it with the other function. So we have 2t squared minus t squared. We say, okay, so we're going to take 8t times our derivative. So the derivative would be, derivative of 2t squared would be 4t. Root of minus t squared is minus 2t. Does that equal? That's our question. Well, we have 14 minus 4 minus 3, 10 times 2t squared minus t squared. Well, okay, on this left-hand side, multiply it in. It's 32t minus 16t. On this right-hand side, okay, well, a little bit more work, but 28t squared plus 4t squared uh, oh yeah, I forgot when I multiplied the t in, it's going to become squares, right, t times t. See, I could spot my error because I was like, wait a second, I have t squares, but that was c. It's like, ah, oops, I made a mistake. See, the nice thing about verify is you know it works. So if it didn't work with the verify, you know you made a mistake. It's wonderful to have things where it's like, it's free points. You just keep doing it until they match. So anyways... 28 plus 4 makes 32t squared. Uh, minus 6 minus 10 makes minus 16t squared. And lo and behold, again, they match. Life is good, and we're happy. So that's part A. Plug it in. Plug it in. All right. Part B. Find the solution to the differential equation in part A with x of 1 equals 8, 8. So we have some initial conditions here. Of course, a little bit interesting is the fact that we're doing it at time one. And because uh, usually we do it at time zero, but that's no problem. And this part right here is testing us on one idea, which is superposition. Now, oftentimes we don't explicitly spell out what we're testing you on. But what we have is we have two solutions Neither solution works. Neither solution, when you plug in 1, gives you 8, 8. So the question is, well, do you start from scratch? And the answer is no, because we know that this, this is a linear differential equation. And linear says you can combine solutions. And so we say, aha, we have two solutions. And so all solutions look like some constant a, 2t, 3t, plus some constant b, 2t squared minus t squared. And that's the principle of superposition. Now the only thing left for us to do is to figure out, well, what are the right choices for a and b? So we say, OK, what do we do? Well, we plug things in. So we plug in x equals, whoops, sorry, not x t equals 1. And we have, all right, x of 1, which is 8, 8, is equal to a, 2, 3, plus b, 2 minus 1. 
That's the nice thing about plugging in one. Plugging in one and plugging in zero, those are the two nicest numbers to plug in. So you always hope that you're going to be asked to plug in one of those two numbers. So this becomes, reading the top entries, 2a plus 2b is 8. And reading the bottom entries, 3a minus b is 8. Two equations, two unknowns. The bread and butter of, of math. All right, well, at this point, we, we hopefully, this is something that should be automatic. I like to think of it as, well, I don't want two equations with two unknowns. I want one equation with one unknown. Because then, it's known. And so we're going to try to do some elimination. Knock things out. So if I multiply this second equation by 2 and I add, then I'll knock out the b's. 2b? No, it's not 2b. They're gone. But I'll have 2a plus 6a makes 8a. And I'll have 8 plus 16 makes 24. So that tells us a equals 3. On the other hand, we can see here that b is going to be equal to 3a minus 8. Because I can take the second equation, just move the b and move the 8. So that becomes now 3 times 3 minus 8, which is 1. So we say, great. So a is 3, b is 1. Uh, whoops, I should have done it here. a is 3, b is 1. So our final answer would be x equals, and we'll just put it all together, mush it all together. 3 times 2t makes 6t, plus 1 times 2t squared, 2t squared. 3 times 3t makes 9t, and subtract t squared. And we're done. Ah, fun problem, fun problem. Any questions? I, I think I see some questions. How do I know just these two make all the possible solutions? Aha! Great question! And the answer is, how big is this matrix? Two by two, two right? So that says I need two solutions that are, that are different, and once I have two, I'm done. If it had been a three by three, I would have needed three solutions. So the size of the matrix gives away how many solutions I need to get everything. So that's the answer to that question. Okay, how do we know if we need to smush or can we keep them separate? And the answer is whatever you feel like doing. If you read the instructions, I know that's very rare for people to read instructions on exams, but you know, once in your life you should do it. It'll say you don't have to simplify unless explicitly told. And so you would get full points either way. And there are people who prefer keeping them separate. I mean, there are people who prefer putting them together. Do what works for you. Now, in terms of like absolutely getting the most points possible, the fewer steps you can do, the better. Because even something as simple as adding two numbers together, people lose points, even if they're small numbers. One plus one. I remember when I was a student, I put down one plus one equals one on a homework assignment. And the teacher in the class held my homework assignment up. Steve made a mistake. He's human. I felt bad about that for weeks. And never again would I make that mistake. But that's OK. I've made other mistakes since then. But anyways, do what you're, you feel comfortable with. Uh, other questions? All right. Good, well, we're rounding the corner into the fun stuff, which is matrices. Yes, so we should be expecting to see lots of things, you know. This is an initial value problem, good. And now, you can't look at a matrix and know right away repeated roots, complex roots, distinct roots. So, we gotta figure that one out. Okay, so we begin. We want to get really comfortable with this procedure. We start by taking our a minus lambda i, take that determinant, so 11 minus lambda, 
6 minus 15 minus 7 minus lambda. All right, so that's 11 minus lambda times negative 7 minus lambda. Subtract 6 times negative 15. Oh, these are big numbers here. I hope things work out really well. Well, we'll find out. <coughs> lambda squared, that's good news. We have minus 11 lambda plus 7 lambda, right? Minus 11 lambda plus 7. That makes minus 4. Oh, that's not so bad. Then we have minus 77 ugh, plus 90. Oh, okay. We could work with that. Minus 77 plus 90 leaves us at 13. Okay, so lambda squared minus 4 lambda plus 13. All right, good. Now, on a side note, I don't know if you like memorizing facts or not, but this number here in front of the lambda, not the minus, but the number, that's the same as what we call the trace. You add these entries up. So 11 plus negative 7 should be 4. 13, does anybody know where that number comes from? It's the determinant. So this number in the middle is the, the sum on the diagonal. This number is, is the determinant. And you can see, ah, oh, minus 77 plus 90, yep, yeah, 13, okay. So it's ways you can check of course, you should always know that if you add your eigenvalues, it's the same as adding what's on the diagonal. If you multiply your eigenvalues, it's the same as the determinant. It, there, there's little sort of built-in checks. Okay, but now, does this factor? Well, we look at it and we say, I'll try. Hmm, didn't try very hard, but okay, no. All right, it doesn't factor. So what do we do? Oh, quadratic formula people. Okay, all right. You can also do complete the square, whichever one you feel like doing. All right, but quadratic formula, that's on the equation sheet. Because remember, we set that equal to zero. So lambda is equal to negative b, that's four, plus minus the square root, b squared, 16, minus 4ac. So four times one times 13. Four times 13? 52, it's the number of, of cards in a deck. Wait, number of decks in a card? No, number of cards in a deck is the right phrase. I knew that, okay. All right, divide that, 2a. Okay, so four divided by two is, is two. 16 subtract 52. Negative 36. Well, negative, we're gonna get an i. Square root of 36, six. six, and that's also being divided by the two. So it becomes two plus minus three i. Okay, so those aren't bad numbers. Okay, so we now know that number six is complex eigenvalues. All right, so once we have complex eigenvalues and we figure out what the eigenvalues are, we know that we're only gonna solve for one eigenvector because we only have to solve for one eigenvector. The other one is, is sort of in the background for free. We don't write it down explicitly, but that's what it is. So we say, okay, uh, we'll let two plus three i, it's really important to keep track of which eigenvalue you're using. So we're doing lambda equals two plus three i. And we, we come here and we do our subtraction. So we have 11, subtract two plus three i becomes nine minus 3i, 6, minus 15, and then minus 7, minus 2 makes minus 9, minus 3i, times something equals 0, 0. Now, this sounds hard unless you remember that it's easy. And then you're like, oh wait, this is easy. Okay. So how is it the easy thing to do? Well, you pick a row. 
Which row? Doesn't matter. Whichever one you want. Which one do you want? Top row. And you say, okay, what I'm going to do is I'm just going to reverse the order. So instead of 9 minus 3i, 6, it's going to be 6 and 9 minus 3i. But then I'm going to do one more thing, which is I'm going to flip a sign. So let's just flip the sign on the 9 minus 3i. So this will become 6 minus 9 plus 3i. And that's our eigenvector. Now this really heavily leans into 2 by 2s. So this is a time when we're like, oh, thank goodness. Thank goodness the only thing they ask us about are 2 by 2s. Ah, phew, good. Life is good. Life is wonderful. All right. So now that we have our eigenvector, the next step when we're doing complex eigenvalues is to find our solutions. Okay, so how do we do that? Well, the eigenvalue, so this 2 plus 3i, we write as our function e to the 2t cosine 3t plus e to the 2t sine 3t i. So the 2 is the real part, the 3 is the imaginary part. And now we're going to multiply that by our eigenvector, which has been pulled apart. So let's talk about our eigenvector for a second. First off, we don't have to use this exact vector. We can always change it. Is there anything that we can do to it to make it nicer? We can divide by 3, because you can always scale. OK, so let's do that. So divide by 3 becomes 2 minus 3 plus i. This is already looking more friendly. And then the other thing is we can pull it apart. So what we do is we have the real pieces, 2 and negative 3, and the imaginary pieces. Well, you might say, there is no imaginary piece up here. Well, there is. It's 0. So i is 0, 1. So that's our eigenvector scaled and pulled apart. So 2, negative 3, i, 0, 1. And now we multiply. We have the keeping it real crowd. So that's going to be one part. Our general solution looks like some constant. The keeping it real takes real times real and imaginary times imaginary. So real times real, e to the 2t, cosine of 3t times 2 minus 3. And then uh, plus, oh my gosh, they made it too easy on us, those punks. Well, we'll forgive them. We'll forgive them this time. All right. Sorry. Back to our regularly scheduled problem. Uh, I squared. It makes a minus. So actually, I'm going to turn this plus into a minus. e to the 2t sine of 3t times 0, 1. Okay, so real with real. Then there's the uh, imaginary pairing. Those two. So plus b, some arbitrary constant, e to the 2t cosine 3t 0, 1, and then the uh, other part will be e to the 2t sine 3t times 2, negative 3. Okay, so recapping, we had complex eigenvalues, we found our eigenvector, we split it apart, we used this to write our solutions, and now we say at this point we catch our breath, <sighs> And we remember what we're trying to do. Sometimes we want general form. Sometimes we want particular solutions. Sometimes we might even want fundamental matrix. We're after a particular solution. So what should we do now? So now we plug in 0, right? So x of 0 is 2, negative 3. You can kind of see where we're going here e to the 0 and cosine of 0 is 1, so we get a times 2, negative 3. 
that part goes away, plus b times 0, 1. Can anybody figure out a choice for a and b where a times 2, negative 3 plus b times 0, 1 is 2, negative 3? It's a tricky one. It's a thinker. Yeah. You could go through and say, well, read off the top line that says 2 equals 2a and negative 3 equals negative 3a plus b. But pretty quickly you say, oh, wait, a equals 1, b equals 0, even without trying too hard. You say, ah, that says we just want that piece. Just that piece is our answer. Well, that happens. Will it happen on the test? I don't know. Well, I do know. But I'm not going to tell you. I want you to have the fun of finding out what things are going to be on there. Okay. Yes? So I got a third, but I'm using 6 and negative 9 and 0 and 3. Right. So if you hadn't scaled, then you would have gone A equals a third, and then you would have then recovered it shortly thereafter. Yes? Uh, how can you drop the eyes when you change from your foil there and the sign? Right. So in some sense, you said, okay, the real parts came here. Where did the eyes go when you went to this piece here? And the answer is that I is a number. They might think, really? It's a very strange number, Steve. Yes, I agree, it is a very strange number. But since they both had eyes, you could pull it out, and it got absorbed into the B. So essentially, that's where it went. It got absorbed into the B. That, so that's where it's hiding. Okay, yes? One more thing. Can you turn that into a fundamental matrix? Can I? <laughs> or would I? <laughs> You want me to do it live? No. Why not? <clears throat> because I wouldn't do a fundamental matrix that way. I would, I would, <laughs> do you want to know how I would do a fundamental matrix with the complex eigenvalues? Sure. No! Calculators? <laughs> the devil's tools! <laughs> I would never! My gosh! Ugh. Okay. So, once I knew that these were complex, I wouldn't even bother with eigenvectors if I was really after fundamental matrix. Because I'm going to use something a little bit more clever. So, okay, this is not the problem that we were asked to do. So, <laughs> it's okay. If you feel like this is a great time for you to stand up and stretch, that's okay. But here's what I like. Fun fact. If I take the derivative of e to the at, what do you get? What happens? a e to the at. Now, plug in 0, and what should you get? We should get a. OK, that's the only thing I'm going to use. So here we go. We know our eigenvalues look like 2 plus minus 3i. Now, what does that tell us? Well, the 2 says that our answer for, for phi, which I, I'm going to go after e to the at as my fundamental matrix. OK, so I'm not going after phi. I'm going after e to the at. It's going to have the e to the 2t in the front. Now. All the other entries are going to have cosines and sines. Each one of those four entries are going to have cosines and sines. Where are the cosines going to show up? Now, I, 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 I guess I should have said one other s smaller fun fact. I don't know what you call that. If I plug plug in 0 to e to the at, what do I get? You get the equivalent of 1, the identity matrix. Okay, so I have e to the 2t, and then all these entries are combinations of signs 
and cosines. So far, so good. Nothing too surprising. But I, I can tell you right now exactly where the cosines are, and I can tell you exactly the coefficients of the cosines. What happens when you plug 0 into cosine? You get 1. What happens when you plug 0 into sine? You get 0. Good. Now, we know when we plug in 0, we need to get the identity. So where can the cosines show up? They can only show up here. And they have to show up as a single cosine. So there's a cosine 3t and a cosine 3t. But the signs I don't know yet. But so far, so good. Yes? And I've run out of space, so there's going to be more here, more here, more here, more here. Okay, so we now know that we look like e to the 2t cosine 3t plus, and I'll, I'll do little letters here, a of sine of 3t. We have b sine of 3t. C sine of 3t, and then we have cosine of 3t plus d sine of 3t. We haven't actually done very much, right? We, we just say we know it looks like this for the right choices of a, b, c, and d. And we're going to now take a derivative and plug in 0 and see what we get. So when we take our derivatives here, what do we get? So this is e to the a t. Well, I don't know why I'm going down this rabbit hole. But you asked. All right, dangerous. That was your last question. For, no, 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 that's okay. You can ask more questions. Okay, so when we take this derivative, what, what you'll get is, uh, I'm going to multiply the e to the 2 t, two, e to the two t inside. You'll get 2 e to the 2 t. Uh, times cosine 3t plus 2e to the 2t a sine of 3t. You, you get a lot of stuff here, so you have to be very patient here. But most of it's going to go away. Minus 3e to the 2t sine of 3t. And then plus 3a e to the 2t cosine of 3t. This entry here, and I'm just going to do the top row, and you'll see what happens. You're going to get 2 e to the 2t b sine of 3t. And then you'll get an e to the 2t times 3b cosine of 3t. And then there's stuff down here. But now plug in 0, and we get everything with the sine goes away. We get a 2, and that 2 is that 2, plus 3a. And here, that goes away, and we get 3b. Downstairs, we'd have a 3c and a 2 plus 3d. That has to equal... A. So that has to equal 11, 6, minus 15, minus 7. Okay, what's A? 2 plus 3A equals 11. A equals 3. 3B equals 6. 2. 3C equals negative 15. Negative 5. 2 plus 3d equals negative 7. Oh, this one's a thinker. Negative 3. So, that says our fundamental matrix, even better than fundamental matrix, e to the 2t is, sorry, e to the at is e to the 2t cosine of 3t plus 3 sine of 3t, 2 sine of 3t, minus 5 sine of 3t, 
And finally, our last corner is cosine of 3t minus, uh, sorry, is that a minus? It is a minus. I just, minus 3 sine 3t. And there you go. So on a, if I were doing it, I would do this because there's a lot less steps involved at the end of the day. And I know it doesn't feel like a lot less steps, but that's because I rambled. I kept going off on tangents. That's why I'm a good calculus teacher. All right. All right. Number seven. Find the general form for solutions of dx dt. By the way, this is just another way of saying x prime. So if you see the dx dt notation, don't like, oh, what is that? Oh, it's x prime. Oh, okay. 9, 8, minus 2, 1. Hmm, hmm. Okay, well, we don't know what case we're in. So we got to start by finding our eigenvalues. So 9, whoops, ah, 9 minus lambda, 8 minus 2, 1 minus lambda. Set that equal to 0. So you have 9 minus lambda times 1 minus lambda. Subtract negative 2 times 8. That's lambda squared. Then we have a minus lambda. A minus 9 lambda makes minus 10 lambda. Then we have a 9 plus 16. Lambda squared minus 10 lambda plus 25 equals 0. Does lambda squared minus 10 lambda plus 25 factor? Yeah. How does it factor? Lambda minus 5 squared. So our roots are 5 and 5. Okay. Now, here's my mindset. First off, let's just point out where we're at. We are in repeated roots. When you are in repeated roots, internally you should be in your happy place. This is the best case scenario. We love repeated roots. Why? Because we get e to the at for free. And e to the at makes everything easy. You want a fundamental matrix? I've already got it. You want solutions? Grab the columns. You want a particular solution? Multiply it by your initial values. It's just the best. It's the best. It's what you hope for. Will you see it this week? Maybe. Maybe. But if you see it, definitely know how to use it. Okay, so what's, what's the magic formula? It says the following. So e to the at, this, again, this is when you have repeated roots. This only works in that case is equal to e to the lambda t times the identity matrix plus t a minus lambda i. And as a friendly reminder, this equation is on your sheet. You don't have to memorize it. You just have to remember where to look for it. Okay, so for us, now you might say, why are you finding this if it doesn't say find e to the at? Because this is the ultimate tool. It makes, like I said, it makes everything easier once you found it. So in our case, lambda is 5. e to the 5t. The identity matrix, 1, 0, 0, 1. Plus t, we take a minus 5 times the identity matrix. So we're going to subtract 5 off your diagonal entries. So we're going to get 4, 8, minus 2, minus 4. And this is a case where it really does pay to put things together. So 1 plus 4t and 8t minus 2t, 1 minus 4t. Okay. So uh, now the next step is to write the answer down. That's how quickly these go. When you have repeated roots, you can do it in like three or four minutes, which is great. That means you have more time for other problems when you don't have repeated roots. 
Okay, so general form says we're looking for solutions. The columns are solutions. So, we say, great, and we needed two columns, we need two solutions because it's a two by two matrix. And so, we say our solution is some constant A, and don't forget the E to the 5T, E to the 5T, first column. And then some constant B, E to the 5T, don't forget that, second column. And we're done. Because the general solution just says find two solutions and throw your constants in. All right, now suppose you're someone who doesn't like fundamental matrices. You don't like E to the AT. What would you do then? Well, I mean, you can always retake the class until you do like it, but the other thing you can do is when you do have repeated roots, you can say, all right, so, so this is the other option, which I strongly, strongly discourage. Please don't go down this road. You, any, please, 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 anytime you have a repeated root, pull out this formula and life is good. But if you don't want to, you don't have to. So the other option is to say, all right, you, you do your normal a minus lambda i, so that would be 4, 8, minus 2, minus 4, times something equals 0, 0. You hum and you ha for a moment, and you say, ah, I see a solution. 2 minus 1. The problem is you only see one solution. There's just one eigenvector. You came up short. So then what you say is, okay, so all right, that's cool. I'm, I'm, I'm cool like that. What I need to do is I need to find now something that when I multiply 4, 8, minus 2, minus 4, I get 2 minus 1. So what does that? Well, that's not so quick, is it? Ah, oh, yeah. <laughs> See, now you're like, I'm, I'm, I'm starting to appreciate this more, Steve. So 1 half 0 does it. It's not the only one that does it, but there are others. This one works. Okay, so what's the key? If we call this one uh, our vector v and we call this one u, then our two solutions look like e to the lambda t times v plus e to the lambda t, t times v plus u. This is our bumping. So in our case, it'd be a e to the 5t times 2 minus 1 plus b e to the 5t, and then it would be t times 2 minus 1 plus 1 half 0. And you look at this and you say, okay, these don't really seem to match all that well. It's not clear that, in fact, this is the same set of solutions. But it turns out it totally is. They completely overlap. You can get one from the other. But this just... You have to remember stuff, and it's just, this is so fast. Please, please, whenever you see repeated roots, use it. Any questions? I see a question. Yes, it's on the formula sheet. Yes. This semester we added it. A spring 2023 special. Wow. But now you're like, man, what are they going to add in fall 2023? Well, at this point... We have to start thinking about what do we take away. There's so much on there. If we want to add anything, we've got to take something off. All right, number eight. Find e to the at, where a is minus 7, 15, minus 2, 4. Also find the particular solution for x prime equals ax, with x of 0 equals 3 minus 1. Okay. Well... I like to find e to the at, and again, I'm looking ahead for this x prime equals ax with x is 0 equals 3 to negative 1. I'm going to think of it in terms of the fundamental matrix. So another thing that's on the equation sheet is that e to the at is your fundamental matrix phi of t times phi of 0 inverse. 
So there are ways to compute e to the at which have nothing to do with differential equations, but I'm going to use differential equations because that's my, my tool I've learned. So I'm going to use it. All right, well, so we start by saying consider our differential equation, x prime, negative 7, 15, negative 2, 4, x. And uh, as always, we, we do our eigenvalues, minus 7 minus lambda, 15, minus 2, 4 minus lambda. Take that determinant set equal to 0. Oh, these numbers are making me nervous, but I hope they worked out. We'll find out. Okay, take our determinant, you know, down one diagonal, up the other, but subtract. We get lambda squared, no surprise there. Plus seven lambda, minus four lambda, oh, that's nice, that's a three. And then we're gonna get minus 28, plus 30. So that's plus two more. Okay, so does lambda squared plus 3 lambda plus 2 factor? Yeah, what does it factor as? Lambda plus 1, lambda plus 2. All right, so our eigenvalues are minus 2 and minus 1. Okay, so those are our eigenvalues. Now we switch gears. Say, so, okay, let's find the corresponding eigenvectors. We'll start with negative 1. So we have our minus 7 subtract minus 1, which makes minus 6, 15, uh, minus 2, 3, <coughs> wait, sorry, not 3, 5, because it's subtracting a minus 1, so it's adding 1. And we're going to multiply this by something and get 0, 0. Well, this is there anything that works? 15, 6. We can also use the bottom row and get smaller numbers, 5 and 2. Okay. So now, lambda equals negative 2. So we'll have minus 7 minus minus 2, so it's minus 5, 15, and then minus 2, 4 minus minus 2, that's... Uh, 4 plus 2, which is, is 6. Okay, we've got to multiply that by something and get 0, 0. Well, anybody see something that works? 3 and 1. Right. It doesn't have to be 6 and 2. You can just jump right ahead and say, aha, I see something even better than 6 and 2. I see 3 and 1. If you put down 0, 0, that's not good. It's not going to work. Wouldn't be prudent. Okay, so what does that say? Our solutions look like this. They look like 5, 2 times e to the minus t and 3, 1 e to the minus 2t. Okay, so now we found solutions to this differential equation. Okay, but remember our goal was to find e to the at. So how does solving this differential equation get us closer to our goal? Well, these are the columns of phi. So the fundamental matrix is composed of our solutions. So we could say, oh, so phi of t looks like 5e e to the minus t, 2e to the minus t, 3e to the minus 2t, and e to the minus 2t. Just first column, second column. All right. So that's there. That's your phi of t. Cool, 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 cool. I'll just copy it. Now, is phi of t unique? The answer? No. You can have lots of different fundamental matrices, but there's a, a best one. That's e to the at. So now what we have to do is multiply by phi zero inverse. That basically says turn into the best one. 
So when you plug in 0, the nice thing is e to the 0 is 1. So this is 5, 3, 2, 1, inverse. Okay, well, all right. Inverse of a 2 by 2 matrix. We can probably figure that out. We'll, we'll do some work down here in the corner. 5, 3, 2, 1, inverse. 1 over the determinant. What's our determinant here? Negative 1. Ah, they like us. They gave us something that would work. Okay, so this is our determinant. And then, there's, you move some things around. So you swap the diagonal. You flip the sign on the off diagonal. Yes? I hope you've seen this before. Well, you can put the negative th through onto the inside, so that's negative 1 plus 3 to negative 5. Okay, so this becomes 5 e to the minus t, 3 e to the minus 2t, 2 e to the minus, I'm just copying right now, e to the minus 2t times minus 1, 3, 2, minus 5. And now you just Multiply. Minus 5 e to the minus t plus 6 e to the minus 2t. 15 e to the minus t minus 15 e to the minus 2t. Minus 2 e to the minus t plus 2 e to the minus 2t. 6 e to the minus t minus 5 e to the minus 2t. Okay, that's the first thing. There is our e to the at. Now there's a second thing. Also, the particular solution, x of 0 is 3 minus 1. So I'm just going to make some notes here. These are distinct roots. Okay. So there are two options. The use what you've, all the hard work you've put in option, or just say, well, I'll forget all the hard work and just do what I normally do. You'd still get credit for both. What's the use all the hard work you've done option? Yeah. So the nice thing is once you have e to the at, your solution is e to the at times your initial value. So the, the ignore all the hard work is say, OK, throw constants in front, solve for a and b. But here, you say, well, look, I've already done all the work. I just have to do a little multiplication. I mean, it's not, when I say a little multiplication, yes, there's a lot of terms here, but it's mechanic at this point. But you do have to write it all down. That's, by the way, have you ever wondered why? Why does differential equation give you the really big paper for doing the quizzes, whereas calculus, they just get normal sized paper. Our problems take longer because we got to write stuff. Calculus, yeah, spoiled kids. They don't know how good they have it. Okay, I shouldn't say that. But I can because I'm a professor. I've got tenure. <laughs> don't tell them I said that. All right. So, you just multiply, so we're going to take 3 times the first entry, minus 1 times the second, right? 3 minus 1. So we'll have minus 15, minus 15 makes minus 30, okay. 18 plus 15, yes, 3 times 6, minus 15 times 1 makes 33. I'm not feeling so bad about doing this because you'd get some weird numbers here. Okay, minus 6, minus 6 makes minus 12. 6 
plus 15 makes, hmm, what have I copied down wrong? Oh, that's not a, f this shouldn't be a 15, this should be a 5. <laughs> okay, 6 plus 5 makes 11. And we're done. Yeah. Notice, I made a mistake. I'm not surprising. But I caught it because I was like, wait, those numbers aren't working. It's, it's called you checking yourself, right? As the great philosophers have said, check yourself before you wreck yourself. <laughs> so it's not a bad idea to stop and say, wait, do these numbers work? I don't know. I don't know. Let me check it. All right. Is there a way to simplify the matrices? Is there a way to simplify this matrix? Is any of them to make it easier? No. <laughs> it's, it's kind of the work you have to do, unfortunately. Um, there's not a lot of shortcuts at, on these types of problems. I think I saw another question. How do I know that this works? Well, because the theory says it works. So, so the thing is, what you're really doing here when you multiply e to the at times this 3 minus 1, what it's really saying is you're going to take 3 times this solution and minus 1 times that solution. So it's a combination of solutions. And, and so that's why e to the at times anything is always a solution. And it's just it happens to have the right initial value as well. Um, you're right, you could plug it back in. So you could plug it into x prime equals ax. And it's always a way to check. Um, that's a check I would probably wait until the end of the exam to do. Because in principle, if you follow the mechanics, the problem works itself. So you, you might just say, ah, these numbers, 33, ah, that sounds weird. And then you can say, I'll go back and check later. But it's a whole number. That's a plus. I'm not claiming that every answer will be a whole number. So don't be surprised if you see like a, a fraction. Like over 2 maybe. You know, don't let it be like, oh, over 2, something's wrong. I didn't write these problems on the exam. I wrote the problems on the review which are different. All right, uh, any other questions? Okay, number nine. Find a fundamental matrix for x prime equals zero, one, minus nine, six. Okay, so keep in mind a fundamental matrix. So that says I'm after a phi. We're going to decide whether or not there's a particular fundamental matrix we're after in a moment. What's the first thing we need to do? Eigenvalues. You just, because you got to know which one of your categories you're in. Okay, so we, we take our 0 minus lambda, 1 minus 9, 6 minus lambda. We're going to set that equal to 0. We get minus lambda, 6 minus lambda minus 1 times minus 9. That would be lambda squared minus 6 lambda plus 9 equals 0. Does that factor? Yeah, what does it tell us? Yeah, repeated eigenvalues. Now, this is, remember, our happy place. We want repeated eigenvalues. It warms the heart. OK, so now we say, hey, because it's repeated eigenvalues, what do we get for free? E to the AT. So we have that formula. I'll write it down again. And we say, well, why is that helpful for us in answering this question? Well, what is E to the AT? So, Phi is a fundamental matrix. What is e to the at? 
best one. Yeah, this is the best fundamental matrix. So not only are we going to find just any fundamental matrix, we're going to find simply the best. It's better than all the rest. E to the AT. So when it says fundamental matrix and you have repeated, you're just going to go straight for E to the AT, circle it, and life will be good. If it's not repeated, you find solutions, fill up your columns, life is OK. Not as good as repeated, but you know, how often can you get repeated? On this test, at most once. Because there aren't that many questions. OK, so for us, we write things down. Lambda equals 3. The identity matrix is always 1, 0, 0, 1, plus t. And then we're subtracting 3 from our diagonal. Minus 3, 1, minus 9, 3. So we now go ahead and put these together. 1 minus 3, t. 1 minus 9, t. Oh, sorry, not 1. It's 1, t. Minus 9, t. And 1 plus 3, t. Now, you might inevitably ask a question, is this a realistic question, Steve? That seemed really quick. Could we really have a problem on the exam that could be done that quickly? Yes. <laughs> there are several problems on this exam which are almost that quick to do. So don't be nervous. Don't be worried. Don't be nervous. Don't be scared. Be prepared. Any questions? All right. Rounding the corner. Number 10. Find the general form for solutions of x prime equals 5 minus 2, 7 minus 4 x plus 2e to the t plus 36t minus e to the t. All right. Well, this part on the end tells us that we're in non-homogeneous territory. And of course, the most difficult part about non-homogeneous problems is spelling non-homogeneous. But all right, once we've successfully navigated past that obstacle, we say, all right, we have to decide which technique we're using. Because there's two, undetermined coefficients, variation of parameters. Which one are we going to be doing? Sorry, what? Yeah. When you have a chance, use undetermined coefficients. I might say, how do we know if we have a chance? Well, what you look for is you pull it apart by the function. So you'll notice there's e to the t's. Okay, so that's e to the t. 2 minus 1. And then there's a t. So there's a plus t, 36, 0. And you say, what do these functions look like? Do they look like what we would want to see in method of undetermined coefficients? In other words, exponentials, sines, cosines, t to whole numbers. And the answer in this case is yes. So good. We know we're in undetermined coefficients. So the first thing we're going to do is focus on the xc. So that's, we're going to say drop the non-homogeneous part for a few minutes and let's see what happens here. So x prime is 5 minus 2, 7 minus 4, x. So for this we start by looking for the eigenvalues. So we have 5 minus lambda minus 2, 7 minus 4 minus lambda. Take that determinant set it equal to 0. 5 minus lambda minus 4 minus lambda Subtract 7 times minus 2. We'll get a lambda squared. Then we'll have a minus 5 lambda plus 4 lambda. So that's minus lambda. Minus 20 plus 14. This makes minus 6. Does lambda squared minus lambda minus 6 equals 0 factor? Yes. What does it factor as? Negative 3 plus 2. So our eigenvalues are 3 and negative 2. Now, at this point, 
we peek over and say, am I going to have any problems? The answer is no. Because here I have e to the 1t. Here, this is, there's not an exponential function, so it's like e to the 0t. So there's no overlap. That's good. We like it when there's no overlap. Because when there is overlap, what has to happen? Bump it up. Yeah. And we don't have to, which is good. OK. Do we need to keep going with our xc? Yes. Because what is it asking us to find? General form, which means we have to fully find xc. It's not just enough to know overlap or not. If it had only asked us for xp, we could stop here. But for xc, push on. Well, the good news is we don't have to push too much further. So for lambda equals 3, we're going to have uh, put in lambda equals 3, so we get 2 minus 2, 7 minus 7, times something equals 0, 0. Well, do we see a something that works? 2, 2 is good. 1, 1. I like that even better. OK, lambda equals minus 2. So we have 5, oops, not 5. Ha, 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 ha. 5 minus minus 2 makes 7 minus 2, and then 7, and minus 2. Is there something I can multiply this by and get 0, 0? 2, 7. OK, so that says that our xc complementary solution, e to the 3t, oh, some, sorry, ah, some constant, e to the 3t, 1, 1, some constant, e to the minus 2t, 2, 7. All right. Now we're going to focus on our xp. We've already determined that we don't need to bump. We do need to talk about our pieces, so the functions. We know we need e to the t, because that's right there. We know we need t. We don't have to bump, but are we going to need to add anything to our list? Constant. Constant. Yeah. We need to add the 1, because we have a power of t. Once there's a power of t, got to work all the way down. Now, in full disclosure, I actually haven't worked this problem out by hand yet, so I don't know if I'm going to be able to fit in this space. But I want to assure you, undetermined coefficients is still the right answer to go. You know, it's still the right technique, regardless of how much space we require. OK, so our particular solution looks like some vector times AB, so e to the t times AB plus t c d plus e f. So we can even squish this all together. A, oh, I shouldn't use E because there's an E there. Uh, how about we use G, G and F. OK, A, E to the T plus C times T plus G, B, E to the T plus D times T plus F. All right. Well, what do we do? Answer, we plug it in. OK, so take the derivative. That's a e to the t plus c, b e to the t plus d. So this, to be clear, is xp prime. That has to be equal to. 5 minus 2, 7 minus 4, times a e to the t plus c t plus g, b e to the t plus d t plus f. And that is our x p plus, uh, it's a sideways plus, 2 e to the t plus 36 t minus e to the t. OK, so this is our non-homogeneous part. All right. Well, 
I can already regret writing this problem. But that's okay. If I don't do these, I don't learn. We actually did work them out, the problems on the exam. So we do know that the solutions are very straightforward. So, all right, so we, we do a lot of multiplication here. So we're going to get 5a minus 2b times e to the t, 5c minus 2d times t, 5g minus 2f, then we're going to get a plus 2 e to the t plus 36t. And then just run the same thing here, 7a minus 4b, that's times e to the t, 7c minus 4d, that's times by t, 7g minus 4f, and a minus e to the t. Okay, so at this point, you can certainly let out a sigh and be like, Ugh. there's a lot of letters here. We have to solve for A, B, C, D, F, and G. How do we do it? Because there's six things we have to solve for. The good news is, we're six equations that we have. Six equations and six unknowns. I feel like we're getting ready to take that uh, linear algebra class they, they sometimes make engineers take. But, but really, the key is do the individual function. So e to the t. We'll start with the top line. We're going to have a equals 5a subtract 2b and 2. So plus 2. Read the bottom line. B is equal to 7a minus 4b and minus 1. And lo and behold, we have two equations and two unknowns. Okay, so if we work on these two equations, well, first off, we can rearrange this. This says 4a minus 2b because I subtract a is minus 2, and here I'd have 7a minus 5b is equal to plus 1. So I, I move the b, I move the 1. I move the a, I move the 2. The first equation, can we do anything nice there? Divide by 2. 2a two minus b equals minus 1. 7a minus 5b equals plus 1. And now we're like, okay, we can do something here. If you multiply the first equation times negative 5, you get minus 10a plus 7a would be minus 3a plus 5b minus 5b would be 0. Plus 5 plus 1 would be 6. So what is a? Negative 2. We're at 1 sixth of the way there. And it feels like we've just started. Okay, because those statements are true. This equation, 2a minus b equals minus 1, tells us that b is equal to 2a plus 1, but we know that a is negative 2, so we have negative 4 plus 1, which is negative 3. All right? So we know a and we know b. What's next? Well, that's looking at e to the t. Now we can look at just t. Okay, so there's no t on the left-hand side. Over here we have a 5c minus 2d 
and a plus 36. So 5c minus 2d plus 36 has to equal 0. Again, there's no t there. There's a 7c minus 4d times t, and that's it. So 7c minus 4d has to equal 0. All right, well, what can we do here? Again, we can cancel out. Let's cancel out the d's. Multiply the first equation by negative 2. Add it to the second. What do we get? Well, we'll get minus 10c plus 7c is minus 3c. Minus 2d times minus 2 is plus 4d. Minus 4d is 0. Minus 2 times 36 is minus 72. So minus 3c minus 72 equals 0. So that says, hey, we can solve for c. What is c? Negative 24. Yeah, this is definitely not what the test will be like. You're going to have a very different experience on the test than you are watching me do these problems. Because right now you're like, I'm very nervous, Steve. Don't be nervous. OK. So 4 times d equals 7 times c. So what I can do is I can take d, if I divide c by 4 and multiply by 7, so d, all right, uh, is negative 42. OK, now what do we have? So you use the e to the t functions compared coefficients. We use the t compared coefficients. Last, the constants and compare coefficients. So our constants here, we have the c, and that has to equal 5g minus 2f. And then we have the d, and that has to equal 7g minus 4f. But the good news is we solved for c and d. So this says, we have 5g minus 2f is equal to minus 24. 7g minus 4f is equal to minus 42. And you repeat essentially the same thing we've been doing, right? You multiply and cancel. So multiply by negative 2 the first, add them up, and we'll get very similar things that we've been talking about. Minus 3g, the f's cancel. 48 minus 42 is 6. That's a nice number compared to some of the things we've been seeing. So g is negative 2. Now we plug in g equals negative 2. It doesn't matter where. Let's suppose we plug it into the first one. You get minus 10 minus 2f equals minus 24. I know there's a lot of minuses there, but if we add 24 to both sides, add 2f to both sides, we'll get that 2f is equal to 14. So what is f? f is 7. OK. Now, we've done everything except leave ourselves enough space to write down the answer. Uh, I hate when that happens. OK, so we'll put our answer here. Answer. We have the, the complementary solution, so we just copy that. A e to the 3t, 1, 1. B e to the minus 2t, 2, 7. And then we fill in our, our solutions, plus e to the t times a, b, minus 2, minus 3 plus t times your cd, minus 24, minus 42. And then plus your constants, which are your gf, which would be minus 2, 7. OK, there we go. All right, see, if it's on one page, how hard could it be?
one last problem and we'll call it a night. Just for fun. Find a particular solution. So now we don't have to find the general solution, just a particular solution. Find a particular solution, xp, for x prime equals 0 to minus 2, 0, x plus secant squared t, 0. And you may use that this is e to the a t. All right. Well, hmm. Can we use undetermined coefficients? No. You have to use variation of parameters. You have to sort of just go with it. And unfortunately, this is something that's not on the formula sheet. In this particular semester, you're safe, but who knows? In the future, they may not be. So the solution has the form x equals e to the at, which is why e to the at is so cool integral e to the minus a t f of t dt. So that's what variation of parameters boils down to, where this is your f of t. So once you know e to the a t and you know f, it's just a matter of very carefully, step by step, unraveling it. So if you know the formula and you know your pieces, this is one where it becomes mechanical. It's annoying, I'll grant you. But the nice thing is, it just works. You just have to be patient. Make sure you don't make any silly mistakes. So we'll just build it up slowly. Let's start by this computation. Well, first off, let's just start by e to the minus a t. How do you find that? Well, everywhere you see t, put negative t. And here we can use facts about cosine and sine. Cosine is an even function. Sine is an odd function. So when we put the negatives, we can pull them all the way out. Cosine 2t, negative sine 2t, minus minus makes a plus sine 2t, and a cosine 2t. So there's our e to the minus at. e to the minus at f of t. Well, now we're going to multiply. So, lots of writing, secant squared t, 0, is cosine 2t times secant squared, and then 0, sine of 2t times secant squared. All right, now, that's perfectly reasonable to, to write it like that, but we are anticipating. We know what's ahead. We see our future. We're going to have to integrate. So before we do that, let's think about, do we have a chance? Is it possible? OK. Well, yes, you do have a chance. But we have to think about our various ways to rewrite this. Right now, we have 2t on the inside versus t on the inside. It's like comparing apples with other types of apples. It just, it doesn't work right. So what we have to do is, is not do that. So we reach in and we, in our case, we turn over our, our, our sheet and we say, oh, there's a formula here. We say, okay, well, let's grab that. And so, for instance, we know sine of 2t is 2 sine t cosine t. We also know cosine 2t is cosine squared minus sine squared. But because we have a secant, and secant works really well with cosines, we can say, oh, another way to write this is, remember that cosine squared plus sine squared equals 1. I can replace this sine squared by 1 minus cosine squared. So this is the same as 2 cosine squared minus 1. So let's use these. So 2 cosine squared minus 1 times secant squared, 2 sine t cosine t times secant squared. Now, when we multiply, cosine squared times secant squared becomes? One. one. Nice. It's almost like we wanted something very simple. 2 minus secant squared. 
Okay, 2 sine t cosine t times secant squared t becomes? Tangent. Yeah, because one of the cosines, well, just that cosine, will cancel with one of the secants. You still have a sine left and a secant left, but secant is 1 over cosine. Sine over cosine is tangent. Okay, so now we're ready to sort of go to our next layer, the integral. So the integral, e to the minus a t, f of t, dt. Well, that says you're integrating this vector. Now, we've done some differentiation of vectors when we've been verifying things, and we said, oh, differentiate term by term. How do you integrate? Term by term. Term by term, exactly. That's the nice thing about calculus. Uh, it just works like you would want. So we have 2 times t, integral of secant squared, tangent. Integral of tangent, log secant. Yeah, almost ln of cosine. Now, do we need constants here? Just a side note, do we need constants here? No, because we're after xp. If you want xp, you can assume your constants are zero. If you were after a, uh, the general form, you would want to add your constants in, because the constants will show up in your general form. Now, we've worked through uh, some layers here. Remember, this is, this is like a classic onion problem. There's layers involved. There might be a few tiers, but you know, that's just how it is. So the last thing is to have that e to the at multiplying out in front, e to the at integral, e to the minus at f of t dt. So we have e to the at cosine 2t sine 2t minus sine of 2t cosine 2t. We have this integral. 2t minus tangent t, 2 log secant t. And so we multiply. And so we have 2t minus tangent of t times cosine of 2t. And then we have plus 2 sine of 2t log secant of t. Downstairs we'll have a minus 2t minus tangent t sine of 2t and then a plus 2 cosine 2t log secant t and at this point what do we do? Circle it. Yeah we're done. We're not even going to think about simplifying. We're just like we have an answer. We're done. We'll call it a day. And so that's it.